Welcome back to uh, Rock Marriages Thursday Night Bible Study. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here and be able to open God's Word. I feel like it's been a while since I've been able to do this, and uh, so it's an honor to be here. I'm excited about the teaching tonight and digging into to what God has for us, uh, and we'll get into that here in just a moment. But if it's your first time here, or if you're just joining us, uh, maybe you're listening to this recording after after the, uh, the after the fact. Uh, it's an honor to, to have uh, some time with you tonight. Uh, the marriage ministry here at The Rock exists to open God's word, to encourage marriages, to learn uh, how God designed marriage, how God designed men and women, uh, and, and just learn from God's word and, and how if we, as we focus on God in our, in our relationship, that we actually take our focus off of each other and focus on him, that, that we actually grow closer together in our marriages. And so we are here for you guys. Uh, if you're going through a thing and you need to talk to somebody or you'd like to learn more or you have questions about things, uh, get, a, get a hold of us. You can, you can contact us through social media. You can email us at marriage at rockfenton.com, uh, and we will uh, we'll reach out and, and get, get something set up. We can meet with you. We can, we can uh, set something to talk to you guys and uh, hopefully um, uh, draw you into God's Word, and that's what we're all here for. So uh, again, uh, just glad to be here. Uh, there's a, this is the, actually the last time that we're going to be meeting, I guess, virtually this year. <laughs> so this is the last Thursday Night Bible Study of 2020. Uh, we will pick up things in, in 2021 uh, I think it's on January 7th, but uh, we'll send out more information on the marriage ministry going forward, uh, and any updates that we have on, on meeting and all that kind of stuff. So I'd look forward to some more information coming out over the next few weeks uh, via email. Um, and in between now and the next time that we meet, there are at least one extremely exciting thing going on here at The Rock as far as, far as, the, as, far as a meeting goes. Uh, Christmas Eve... So December 24th, uh, right out here at the Rock Church property, so across the street from the main building, uh, where the box building actually is, in the woods, we're going to meet together at 7 o'clock and have an awesome uh, worship gathering and, and gospel message. And so this is an opportunity for all of us to get out and, and see one another outside in a, in a kind of COVID-friendly environment, um, and uh, it should be just a, a really special night. The challenge for you is to invite friends, invite family, invite all those that you can. Uh, there are invite cards at the office that you can grab, uh, grab a stack of and take them out to your work, to your, uh, you know, your neighborhood, your local gas stations, grocery stores, and all that kind of stuff. Anybody you run into, invite them over to the, uh, the Christmas Eve service. So should be a lot of fun. So hope to see you guys there. So we have been in this, uh, this, this Couples of the Bible uh, teaching series throughout the fall, and it's been a lot of fun to dig into some of the couples in the Bible and learn from what they, what they can teach us. Uh, and today we're going to dig into David and Bathsheba, so a very kind of well-known uh, well, well-known couple, uh, David especially being a very well-known uh, character or, or person in the Bible. And so many of you have maybe heard this story or heard of this story or at least heard of David. And so we're going to dig into uh, to this relationship that David and Bathsheba had. It did not start off well. Uh, it started off in, in, a, in a sinful way. And so we're going to look at uh, kind of how we can learn from that. So we're going to examine this in a couple different ways. We're going to look at how David got himself into some trouble uh, in, uh, in adultery, basically, uh, and, and got himself into sin. We're going to look at how that happened, but we're going to mainly focus on how can we, you know, how did he get there and what can we do in our marriages to prevent that from happening? Uh, and what are the consequences that it caused in his life and, and for those around him? Uh, and also, what role do those around him and those around us play in accountability and, and sin and things like that? And in the end, we're going to look at how God can, can use anything, uh, good or bad. He, God will use it all for his glory and his plan. And so we'll dig into uh, to how that happens as well. So a little history about David. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it as brief as possible. Um, David was anointed to be the second king ever of the nation of Israel. So Saul came before him, and then, uh, uh, you know, at a young age, uh, God used uh, the prophet Samuel to, to actually anoint David and say, you're going to be king, God has called you to be king one day, uh, used for great things even from a young age, and, and, and not, not long after... Uh, also at a young age, you know, he, he, the, the story of David and Goliath, many of you have heard of, uh, he goes out and, and uh, this young kid uses a stone to, to, to literally 
you know, end a war, end a battle at least by defeating the, the giant Goliath uh, and killing him with his own sword and a stone. And so uh, you know, God just using him for these amazing things. It's a whole other uh, great story to look at. Uh, he's called a man after God's own heart in 1 Samuel 13, chosen by God and anointed to be king. And when it was his time to be king, you know, he, he started off really well. He was kind of just conquering everyone around him and expanding the, the, the nation of Israel and everything was going his way. Uh, and it was a, a really great time for him. He started off things, uh, things really well as, as king. And this is where we kind of set into the story when, uh, when things kind of go downhill. And very often in our own lives, it can be the same. Sometimes when things are going well, it's exactly where the enemy wants us. Not really paying attention, kind of on the autopilot, kind of uh, not really worrying about much, thinking we got this under control. Life is just kind of rolling along. We get busy. We get distracted with things of this world. And that's exactly when the enemy can sneak in, when we let our guard down. And this is exactly what happened with David. So we're going to start off the story in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11. And we're going to read through this, verse 1 through 5, and then we're going to dig into it uh, here verse by verse. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 says this. In the spring of the year, the time when the kings went out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him and lay with him now. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So we have this, uh, this, this scenario, this situation we kind of zoom into in David's life. He's king. All the, all the other uh, the men are out to battle, and he's there. He sees this beautiful woman. He's out in his palace, and he, he sees this woman. And, uh, and, and he falls into this great sin. This is a, another man's wife that he's lusting after, that he's looking at, that he's desiring and, and acts on this, this, uh, this, this act of adultery. No matter what, he was the king, no matter how much money he had, no matter how great his house was, no matter how many friends he had, no matter how much money, no matter how many things, none of that mattered. He still fell into this great sin, separating him from God. And this is exactly, we're all on the same level playing field when it comes to sin. You know, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're the president, it doesn't matter if you're the richest, the poorest, doesn't matter what you are. We all are equal. We all have these equal temptations. We can equally fall in and destroy the things that, uh, um, that God has allowed us to have and break our relationship with him. We always need to be on guard. He wasn't immune to it, David, no matter how great he was. So where did things go wrong for David? Let's, let's look at this. What, what happened? Let's, let's kind of analyze these things and try to learn from this so that we don't end up in this same situation in our life. So 2 Samuel 11, verse 1 says this, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. This was a time when David was supposed to be, I mean, he's the king, the leader, He's supposed to be out to battle. All of his commanders were out. It says that he sent them out, that they were out doing battle. And he stayed back. He remained in the kingdom. He remained in, in the palace. And uh, I imagine with the majority of the men out to battle somewhere during this particular time, it says specifically this was the time when they, when they all went out to do this thing, that the majority of the people left in the city, around the palace, around people's homes, in the marketplace, in the villages, all these things were, were women. And so here's David not doing what he's supposed to do. It says, you know, he, he, he wakes up, you know, in the afternoon after laying on his couch. He's just laying around, putting himself in a position to be tempted, putting himself in a place where he shouldn't have been. He should have been off doing what he was supposed to do. He stayed back. He was careless. This is the first offense that we have in protecting our marriages against 
falling into sin of, of, of many kinds, but especially in the sins of lust of the eyes and temptation and flirtation and adultery and other things like that. The first offense is that we do not allow ourselves to be put into those positions in the very first place. You stay so far away from those things, so far, far away from those interactions, from those places where temptation can happen, you stay so far away from it that it doesn't happen, that it won't happen, that it doesn't even look from other people around like something fishy could be going on between you and another man or woman. This is our first line of defense. It's, it's about accountability. These are good things to put into practice. Lisa and I have, have put these things we've learned over the years uh, to kind of put some, some general rules into effect in our marriage. We do not spend time alone in houses or neighborhoods or driveways or bedrooms or family rooms or living rooms or even here at work and other places. We do not spend time alone with another man or woman. There's always needs to be, always needs to be a third person present. Sometimes that's one of our, our older children or uh, coworkers or other people around. There always needs to be accountability. There should never be a, a, a time or a place off in the darkness, off in the secret. We don't drive alone in a vehicle with another man or another woman. That's a, another rule that we've kind of put in place. Among many others, you know, texting and, and phones and emails and all these other kinds of communication and, and these things are all open to one another so that there's never a time when somebody, you know, can be sending messages back and forth or emails or secret things or anything like that. It's all out on the table, out in the open, and we, we don't put ourselves in places we shouldn't be. That is the first line of defense. These are good rules to put into practice in your marriage and in your life. Have accountability always. Don't ever put yourself in a situation where somebody could say, what's going on here? What's, what are these guys? I saw these guys coming out of this building or out of this house or out of this room or out of this car. I saw these guys driving down the road together. Where were they going? Where were they coming from? What's going on? It, you know, no matter how, it doesn't really matter what it looks like to other people necessarily, but it's about being above reproach and being accountable. If we're, not in, if we're not ever putting ourselves in situations where we can be tempted, we won't be tempted. And that's the point. And so David fails at this right off the bat. Moving on, 2 Samuel 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 2 and 3. I like how this starts in the ESV Bible I'm reading here. It says, it happened. Late one afternoon, and this is interesting too, David's obviously waking up late in the afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. So here King David walks out on his balcony or porch or whatever. I mean, he's in a palace, so I'm sure he's above you know, the rest of the, the houses and, and, and things around him and he sees this woman on, you know, and she's beautiful. And verse 3 says, And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Somebody told him right off the bat, this is somebody's wife. Number one, she was married already. Number two, David had an opportunity right here, right now, before anything went downhill. He had an opportunity to repent of maybe, maybe something that was in his heart, maybe the lust of his heart. The Bible says that if you look upon another woman with lustful intent, that that's basically committing adultery. You know, if you're, gonna, if you're lusting after women with your eyes and with your thoughts and with your mind, that's, you might as well just go ahead and do it. You know, he, he was already off on that path, but he could have turned right there and repented. He could have turned right there and said, Lord, uh, I just I had these thoughts. I did this thing. Please help me turn away from this thing. And he could have walked back inside and went back to bed on the couch or whatever he was doing. He could have changed the trajectory of what happens here right in that moment. And God always gives us this moment. So it's a fork in the road. Every time before we walk into sin, every time before we go down a path that leads us into temptation, we come to a fork in the road. We come to a a point of decision. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells us that there's always a way out. There's always a way out. There's, there's never a situation where, oh, I just couldn't, I, I just couldn't help it. I didn't have a choice. I don't, I don't know what happened. There's a point when we can choose God or sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 
One of the most misinterpreted verses, I think, that I've heard from many people. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Number one, there's nothing new here. This is the same sin that you and I struggle with, that, that you know, men and women, uh, human beings, the, the same sins that we struggle with are the same sins that Adam and Eve struggle with, the same sins that have been around since the, the, the dawn of creation. There's nothing new under the sun. This, this isn't like the first time that, that you, you know, it feels like no one's ever gone through this before. No one ever had to put, do, make these decisions. No one ever had to go through this thing. And it's saying here, nothing's not common. This, this, is, all, this is all things that, that we all uh, have to deal with. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Many times this is translated in people's minds that God won't give you more than you can handle. That's a whole other thing. This is talking specifically about temptation. God will not tempt you beyond your ability. That means that you always have the strength and the ability to make the right decision. You're never, this, this is telling us, you are never in a situation where you cannot make the right decision. Because this, with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. David had the way of escape. He had a choice to make. He looked, he saw, he could have turned away at that point and walked back inside and carried on with a godly life. He didn't choose that road. Many times we don't choose that road. Many times we make the wrong choice. Many times we fall into temptation just as David did. But we always have a choice. The Holy Spirit nudges us. It's that moment when we feel the grinding, when we feel the, the little angel and the, and the little devil on our shoulders fighting each other. And, and, and you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. You hear God speaking to you, choose this path. And our flesh, on the other hand, burning for whatever desire it might be, whatever sinful temptation it might be. In this case, in David's case, it was the lust of another woman. He always gives us a choice before it's too late. David could have walked out and ended the story, but he didn't. So what does this lead to? What happens? Back in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 4 and 5, says this. So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. So I'm going to stop here. And I'll explain this. Lisa and I talked about this last night. <laughs> Didn't want to deal with this. I was going to skip over the parentheses here, but we're going to deal with this. So basically what it's saying here, and the reason that this is in here, at first I thought, why is it saying that she's purifying her from her uncleanness? Her uncleanness? Basically, it was her time of the month. And it's saying this specifically because this, this shows that she was not pregnant by her husband. She was not pregnant before this. She was coming off of that time of the month, and this happened after that. And so it kind of clarifies what, you know, the, the doubt that might be in our head. Well, maybe, you know, she was pregnant before this. No, it was, it was happened because David sent and inquired about the He sends people to get this woman and bring her to the palace. And it says that he laid with her. And then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So maybe he thought he, you know, maybe he thought he got away with this. Maybe he thought this was a, a one-time thing. Maybe he thought no one would find out. Maybe he thought all of these things. But sin has a way of multiplying real quickly. He takes her, he lays with her, and she's pregnant. So this is when things start to spiral downhill. And this is what happens with sin. When we don't repent and turn away from sin and ask God to help us, to forgive us, to guide us back to the path that we should have taken in the first place, when we keep on down this path, it takes a sharp veer and it goes right off a cliff usually. And this is when lives turn into more lives and cover-ups turn into more cover-ups. It's gonna happen in your marriage, things that are trying to, you're trying to hide. God sees it all. He starts to try to hide things. He thinks, okay, 
I did this thing. I, you know, Uriah is one of his command, one of his generals or one of his commanders of some sort. He, he's some kind of a, a leader in, in the military. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call Uriah back from battle because Uriah is out there, you know, out there fighting, fighting battles for David. He's, I'm going to call him back and I'm going to give him some time with his wife you know, some R and R back on base. I'll call him back. Hey, man, chill out. Here you go, go hang out with your wife, and then maybe they'll sleep together, and then maybe he'll think all along that it was his child instead of mine, and this will all go away. Well, Uriah the Hittite, he comes back, and David tries to in, in, encourage this this thing to happen. But you know what? Uriah is an honorable man, and he says, "I'm not gonna go off and you know have this R and R and spend time with my wife when all my men are out there at battle. They don't get to come home and spend time with their wife. So why should I? I'm not gonna do this." And it says he sleeps at the palace his door, like outside the door. He doesn't go home. He doesn't go to his to his wife and, and relax and stuff. He's waiting to get back to battle. He's an honorable man. And so this plan fails. So he goes back off to battle. So now David said, what can I do now? This didn't work. What, what, what next? So he comes up with another plan. I'm gonna call Uriah's commander. I'm gonna send him a message and I'm gonna say, hey, what I want you to do is take, I want you to take your eye. I want you to put him and his, his, his company out at the front of the battle. Send him right into the, to the middle of the thick of the battle. And then I want you to pull your men back and let him be consumed by the enemy. Now he's committing murder. Now he's plotted to kill this man who has done nothing wrong. The innocent man, husband of a wife, back at home. And David is plotting to kill him, and his plan worked this time. Uriah the Hittite goes out. The commander pulls back, and Uriah is overtaken by the enemy and killed. So maybe David thought, all right, solve that problem. Throughout this, this whole thing, when sin enters our life, number one, there's lots of... of uh, there's lots of uh, people around us that are, they get hurt there's lots of people around us. There's lots of, um, you know, in, in, in uh, indirect fire that happens. There's lots of people that are innocent all around us that end up getting hurt. Uriah is an innocent party here. So David clear, cleans, his, cleans his slate of this. He thinks he's got this all taken care of, but your sin has a way of finding you out. In 2 Samuel 11, we'll skip down here, verse 26 and 27 says this. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah heard, well, excuse me, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll read. This is the end of, of what happened to Uriah the Hittite. When the wife of Uriah heard, this is Bathsheba, when she heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So this is the point. David maybe thought that he wiped his hands clean of this thing. He takes now her as his wife and thinks that he has kind of wiped the sleen, the, the clate sleen, but it doesn't always, very rarely works that way. Your sin has a way of finding you out. And so uh, here we continue on in 2 Samuel 12. We're going to read through this 1 through 9. This guy named, this guy named, uh, uh, Nathan, this prophet of God, this man of God, he's sent, uh, sends Nathan, he says, I want you to go talk to, to the king and, and tell him this story. And so this is what happens. So, so this whole thing happens with Bathsheba. He thinks everything's clear. Then, the, then one day this guy, Nathan, walks in the door and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, he's telling him this story. He says, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and one poor, the rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb when he had brought, that he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And then in verse 5, then David 
He gets angry. So, you, have, you know, Nathan comes in, he's telling this story. He's like, look, there's this rich guy. He's got all these herds. He's got everything he wants. He's got all these sheep and all these things. And then there's this poor guy over here. He's, all he's got is this one little lamb. And he, he loves this thing. You know, it's, it's this, this cuddly little lamb. He lets it into his house. He's, you know, feeding it from the table. Basically, it's a pet to him. They all love it. He raves it, at, you know, with his kids and, and everything like that. And so, you know, this traveler comes along and the rich man, it was custom at that time for uh, if a traveler would come by that you would give him a place to stay and, and, and give him some food. And, and the rich man says, well, I'm not going to kill one of my sheep for this guy. Instead, I'm going to go take this other guy's sheep. I'm going to take the poor man's sheep. And he, and he takes this guy's sheep and he, he uses that to prepare you know, a feast for this traveler that comes through. And so David hears the story and he says, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Verse seven, Nathan looks David in the eye and he says, you are the man Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. He did all these things. Verse nine says, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? He knows what he did. God knew the entire time and he sends this man, Nathan, to come in there and expose this thing that David thought that he had hidden. This teaches us a couple things. You're not getting away with anything. God sees it all. Sooner or later, one day, things will come to light. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is truly hidden from the Lord. But the real thing that I see here is this man, Nathan. I think about him. I think about him walking into the throne room of the king and, I, and, and, and calling him out, basically, most likely in front of his subjects and servants and other people. I think of Nathan and the accountability and the, and the boldness that it took for him to walk into that room of the king and say, look, You've done this thing and it's evil in the sight of the Lord. Why have you done this thing? It's, it's you, David. You've taken this man's, this man's wife and taken her for your own and killed him as, as, a, as a counter, uh, as collateral damage. But having Nathan around was the right thing for David. And we need to have people like Nathan around us in our life. We need to have, uh, we talk about accountability partners a lot in the marriage ministry, whether you're a man or woman, you should have people that are in your circle that good people who can point you to the word of God and measure up your life against the word of God. And you need to be open to listen to their counsel when they counsel you correctly from the word of God and when they maybe call out or point out sin in your life. You have to be open to that. But we also need to be open to be that accountability person for others. It is important that we grow in, in our walk with the Lord, that we grow relationships with, with others around us and that we're able to have that, that open door into their life where we can come to somebody. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a coworker, maybe a neighbor, maybe somebody that you know, maybe somebody from church, maybe whatever it is that you can see something that they're doing in, that is sinful and you can say, hey man, look, you know, hey, uh, I, I want to I wanna talk to you about this thing's been on my mind. God's leading some of my heart. I just want to talk to you. You come to them from a place of love and you say, look, the Bible says we shouldn't be doing these things. I see, see you doing these things. I just, I'm, I, I'm saying something for you. I don't want you to, I, I, I hate to see you, uh, you know, down, go down this path, you know. That's how we, we come to somebody in love and we, we help to expose the sin in their life. I'm sure Nathan didn't, it's a hard conversation to have with people. I've been in this position. Often I've been in this position where I've had to go and, and say something. It's, it's a difficult thing to do, and I'm sure it was difficult for Nathan, but this is what we've been called to do, bear one another's burdens in life. We're, it, it's, it, we've been called to help each other along. We're not on this journey alone. Because of Nathan, 
walking in and exposing this sin and saying, look, this is, you did this thing and it, and it and it's, has separated you from the Lord. 2 Samuel 12, uh, verse 13 and 14 says, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. There were consequences for, for the sin in David's life. There were consequences. There were things that there, there are, for years there would be consequences of this particular sin. It would cause sin. It would cause trouble in his family. It would cause trouble with the, with the successors to the throne. It would cause trouble with all kinds of things. There are real consequences in life that we have to deal with because of sin. But the Lord will forgive there's nothing that you have done or I have done that is too great a sin, that is too awful a thing that cannot be forgiven by the Lord. In 1 John, verse, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will Forgive us. We have to turn away from our sin and seek the Lord, repent of that sin, ask him for forgiveness, and he will be the first to put us back on the path. David felt this way, and because of what Nathan said to him, because of Nathan walking into the throne room, being bold and, and helping to uh, confront David in his sin and expose it, David was at that point forced to deal with it. And David was repentant. David hated what he had done. It burned him up. Psalm 51, David writes, just after this whole thing had happened. We'll read a couple verses here, but the whole thing is about his repentance and his, his just disgust with what he has done. It says here, a title to the section in, in my Bible says, to the choir master, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. David says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David gets on his knees and he begs to the Lord to forgive him for what he's done. And the Lord will forgive you. Not a single one of us has to live our life condemned by what we have done. We live our life in the grace and peace under the blood of Jesus Christ that washes us clean. We don't have to live in condemnation. You never know what God will use you for, even the mistakes that you've made. When you come clean and you repent and you turn away and you go down the path of righteousness with God, you'll be amazed at what he will do in your life. It's no different for David. In Matthew... Matthew 1 gives the uh, lineage of Jesus Christ. We're coming up on Christmas here, and I thought it appropriate to end with what David's sin and mistakes and relationship and repentance, what all of this, this whole story, what this whole thing, what, what, God would, what, what could God possibly use this mess for? But many years later, many years down the road, Matthew 1, verse 6, says, And Jesse, the father of David, the king, this is the lineage, the, the family tree of Jesus. And it says, And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And it goes on, And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And then down in verse um, 16, it says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. Many years later, God would use the very family tree of David himself, his very lineage down through the years to bring into this world the very greatest thing to ever happen, the birth of Jesus Christ, that God would send his son to be born through the line of David in the city of Bethlehem, that he would later go on to die on the cross to forgive us, to pay the ultimate price 
for the sins that we have committed, big or small, that if we should just believe in him as our Lord and Savior, that we will be wiped clean, that we will be added to the kingdom of God. What an amazing thing. And you never know what God will use your life for, whether it is sometimes mistakes, sometimes success. God will use it all for his glory, and he certainly used David. I hope that you uh, were able to relate to the story of David and Bathsheba, this account of, of him and and learn something. I know I've learned a lot. Every time I, I dig in and, and read this, I get something different, get something more out of it. And so it's, a, it's an awesome thing to, to learn from. Uh, we're going to join a, some, some, some small groups, some virtual small groups after this. I hope that you will join us. Uh, there'll be links uh, available in the email that was sent out, as well as you can uh, ask us here uh, if you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, and we can get you hooked up with a small group if you'd like to meet uh, with us tonight. Thank you guys for being here. I hope you have a Merry Christmas, and we'll see you guys next year. Have a great day, church.